Well, I want to start this morning with a Native Indian prayer uh, in honor of the little church up the road that was run by Don and LaVon Wells, and then your new leader here. Great white spirit, all powers that are directing, Father Sky, Mother Earth, I send you my voice to the spirit world. Lean close to the earth that you may hear me. Hear me, four quarters of the world. From the west, where the thunder beings have sent us rain. From the north, whence comes great white cleansing wind. From the east springs the light to where the morning star gives to men great wisdom. And to the south, whence comes the sun and the power to grow. These four spirits are only one. I call forth the great white eagle for power, for it is the highest and sees the furthest and bridges both worlds. Give me strength to walk on the earth. I am a relative to all that is. With your power, I can face the world and I can face the winds. This is my prayer. Hear me. Ahoe. This is a great time to remember a classic from Dr. Ernest Holmes. It's one of his affirmative prayers. And it's even more appropriate now than ever before. I know there is one mind, which is the mind of God in which all people live and move and have their being. I know there is a divine plan for humanity and within this pattern, there is infinite harmony and peace, cooperation, unity, and mutual helpfulness. I know that the mind of man, being one with the mind of God, shall discover the method, the way, and the means best fitted to permit the flow of divine love between individuals and nations. Thus, harmony, peace, cooperation, unity, and mutual helpfulness will be experienced by all. I know there shall be a free interchange of ideas, of cultures, of spiritual concepts, of ethics, of educational systems, and scientific discoveries. For all good belongs to all alike. In bringing about world Peace. I know that all people and all nations will remain individual, but united for the common purpose of promoting peace, happiness, harmony, and prosperity. I know that the deep within every person the divine pattern of perfect peace is already implanted. I now declare that in each person and in leaders of thought everywhere, this divine pattern moves into action and form to end to the end that all nations and all people shall live together in peace, harmony, and prosperity forever. So it is now. Well, welcome to Awakening Ways this morning. Ah, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. As we experience this holiday season, there is so much to celebrate and be thankful for, regardless of our religions, our belief systems, our traditions, and festive gatherings abound and steep us in deep, meaningful connections. It is a time of sharing and celebrating and love as we joyfully embrace our loved one's seasonal rituals and earthly experience. 
as a minister doing weddings, I'm used to holding this up. <laughs> and using it on the podium is a little distracting, but it also helps me keep my hands from being too Italian. <laughs> you see, eating spaghetti and pizza and meatballs has a different way of experiencing life, isn't that? Okay. It's a time for sharing and celebrating in love as we joyfully embrace our loved ones, seasonal rituals, and earthly existence. It is also a season that invites us to sense beyond our physical boundaries and limitations. We may temporarily inhabit physical bodies, but we are very much spiritual beings. After all, having embodied our souls calling from the source of divine love, and at this soul level, something continuously invites us back to the fold of divine love in the spirit of oneness. Whisperings of our soul welcome and guide us to experience the soul as the glorious divine light that we all emanate from. Given the state of the world today, this divine light may seem elusive at times, but we are always welcomed back into its arms, warmth and brilliance unconditionally. And it is here that we ultimately will find the answers to that which we seek. Albert Einstein said this, a human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Unquote. As we individually align with our divine light and our deepest truths, we can collectively meld into the wisdom of the divine as we free ourselves from the constraints from our earthly distractions. All of humanity will benefit and flourish when we can behold all of life through this lens of oneness, appreciation, and deep connection. Was it not only our Founder's heartfelt purpose to offer all of humanity the tools and resources to go within, celebrating in the divine light and love of all, as we consciously live full and deliberate lives, but also like other like-minded sojourners on the path. We here are in the process as we evolve into the highest possible versions of ourselves. Did you know there's a newly discovered book in the, in the book of Genesis. It has provided answers to where do pets come from. <laughs> Adam said, Lord, when I was in the garden, you walked with me every day. Now I do not see you anymore. I was lonesome here, and it is difficult to, for me to remember how much you love me. And God said, no problem. I will create a companion for you that will be with you forever and who will be a reflection of my love for you so that you will love me even when you cannot see me. Re 
regardless of how selfish or childish or unlovable you may be, this new companion will accept you as you are and will love you as I do in spite of yourself. And God created a new animal to be a companion for Adam. And it was a good animal. And God was pleased. And the new animal was pleased to be with Adam, and he wagged his tail. <laughs> and Adam said, Lord, I have already named all the animals in the kingdom, and I cannot think of a name for this new animal. <laughs> and God said, no problem, <laughs> because I have created this new animal to be a reflection of my love for you. His name will be a reflection of my own name, and you will call him Dog. <laughs> and Dog lived with Adam and was a companion to him and loved him. And Adam was comforted, and God was pleased, and Dog was content and wagged his tail. After a while, it came to pass that Adam's guardian angel came to the Lord and said, Lord, Adam has become filled with pride. He struts and prings like a peacock, and he believes he's worthy of adoration. Dog has indeed taught him that he is loved, but perhaps too well. And God said, no problem. I will create for him a companion who will be with him forever and who will see him as he is. The companion will remind him of his limitations so he will know that he is not all worthy of adoration. And God created Cat <laughs> to be a companion to Adam. And Cat would not obey Adam. And when Adam gazed into Cat's eyes, he's reminded that he was not the supreme being. <laughs> and Adam learned humility. And God was pleased. And Adam was greatly improved. And Dog was happy. And the cat didn't give a rip one way or the other. <laughs> I found that. I just had to share it this morning. <laughs> I want to share what Jimmy and Screaming Jimmy and I came up with this morning as the musical inspiration. We were talking and we had several ideas and I thought the perfect thing is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer because it also has personal messages. And it's time for me to tell you a true story of Rudolph. And it will hit a number of your heartstrings as, as it does mine. A man named Bob DeMay, depressed and brokenhearted, stared out his drafty apartment window into the chilling December night. His four-year-old daughter, Barbara, sat on his lap, quietly sobbing. Bob's wife, Evelyn, was dying of cancer. Little Barbara couldn't understand why her mommy would never come home. Barbara looked up into her dad's eyes and asked, Why isn't mommy just like everybody else's mommy? Bob's jaw tightened, and his eyes welled with tears. Her question brought waves of grief, but also anger. It had been the story of Bob's life. Life always had to be different for Bob. Small when he was a kid, he was often bullied by other boys. He was too little at the time to compete in sports. He was often called names he had rather not remember. From childhood, Bob was different and never seemed to fit in. 
Bob did complete college, married his loving wife, and was grateful to get his job as a copywriter at Montgomery Wards during the Great Depression. Then he was blessed with his little girl, but it was short-lived. Evelyn's bout with cancer stripped them of all their savings, and now Bob and his daughter were forced to live in a two-room apartment in the Chicago slums. Evelyn died just days before Christmas in 1938. Bob struggled to give hope to his child for whom he couldn't even afford to buy a Christmas gift. But if he couldn't buy a gift, he was determined to make one. A storybook. Bob had created an animal character in his own mind and told the animal's story to little Barbara to give her comfort and hope. Again and again, Bob told the story, embellishing more with each telling. Who was this character? What was the story about? The story Bob May created was his own autobiography in fable form. The character he created was a misfit outcast like he was. The name of the character? A little reindeer named Rudolph with a big shiny nose. Bob finished the book just in time to give it to his little girl on Christmas Day. But the story doesn't end there. The general manager of Montgomery Ward caught wind of the little storybook and offered Bob a nominal fee to purchase the rights to print the book. Wards went on to print Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and distribute it to children visiting Santa Claus in their stores. By 1946, Wards had printed and distributed more than six million copies to Rudolph. That same year, a major publisher wanted to purchase the rights from Wards to print an updated version of the book. In an unprecedented gesture of kindness, the CEO of Wards returned all rights back to Bob May. The book became a bestseller. Many toy and marketing deals followed, and Bob May, now remarried, with a growing family, became wealthy from the story he created to comfort his grieving daughter. But the story doesn't end there. Bob's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, made a song adaptation to Rudolph. Though the song was turned down by popular vocalists as Bing Crosby and Dinah Shore, it was recorded by the singing cowboy, Gene Autry. <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was released in 1949 and became a phenomenal success, selling more records than any other Christmas song with the exception of White Christmas. The gift of love that Bob May created for his daughter so long ago kept on returning back to bless him again and again, and Bob May learned the lesson, just like his dear friend Rudolph, that being different isn't so bad. In fact, being different can be a blessing. And although Rudolph is no longer in the highest rankings, he is 11th in the framework. And Rudolph has been recorded by almost 50,000 versions to this day. White Christmas has sold over 50 million. And has 128,000 versions. Now, the parts about this story that got to me was two days before Christmas in 1989, my first wife died in my arms. And for five months, 
I was basically alone, unemployed, waiting for something to happen. And finally I said, I have to move forward. And I wrote to five different places within the prison system as I was teaching. And I got a call from Corcoran State Prison. I went down and interviewed. And the interview consisted of four words. When can you start? <laughs> so I said, I'll be back right after Easter. And I started there. And that following Sunday was the first time I stepped into the Religious Science Church of Visalia, where I also met my future wife. In June of 1998, I had finished my ministerial studies, and we decided that where do we want to start our church? And the consensus was, why live in the fog when it can be a marine layer? <laughs> and after 465 Sundays later, we decided to make things more fun and turn things into more of a teaching discipline and do weddings. And as a result, with 90% of 400 weddings done together, I lost my Jackie last year to cancer. And so again, I had to move forward. And I'm so grateful for this teaching because it got me to where I am today. And I know I'm not the only one. I want to finish this morning with a Christmas letter written by Dr. Ernest Holmes. Christmas is for remembrance. The love manifesting through our gifts to each other typifies the offering of life, the givingness of spirit to its creation. The hands of the eternal are outstretched through our hands and the heart of the infinite beats in the human breast. But the giver must give of himself, for the gift without the giver is bare. It is not then in lavish gifts that we find true giving, but in the sweet simplicity of remembrance, in the kindly thought, the tolerant mind, and the gentle act. Love alone can give love, Sympathy alone can sympathize, and only goodness can really do or be good. The one who gives for reward does not give at all. He seeks to bargain, to trade for spiritual gifts. Hence, he senses loss in his own giving and finds no completion through the act. But he who gives half his meat to the hungry feels justified and is warmed by a real sense of comradeship. He has established an actual unity between himself and the other offspring of creation. Great causes succeed when there is a giving of humanity. With the check must come the one who wrote it, his interest, his enthusiasm, his love. The check must be a symbol of his desire to impart himself. Then shall it multiply its benefits and do good. Charity is cold, but love is warm. When heart speaks to heart, a divine conversation has taken place, a heavenly discourse. Each of us has something to give. Let each see that he gives of his best. If we are giving our gifts to the altar of love, 
Nothing less than the best will be acceptable. Nothing less than all is enough. May the real spirit of Christmas, the giving of self to life, enter and abide in you now and through all time. Namaste. Namaste.